This video is sponsored by Honkai Star Rail. Dizzy's new movie Wish is aggressively inoffensive. It's a film meant to celebrate Dizzy's 100th anniversary, but rather than being a reminder of what made the studio great, it's a testament to how stale and tired the brand's mainline movies have become, and how obvious that is in a sea of innovation. This film, it's okay, I don't hate Wish, but it is just okay in nearly every regard, minus the art style, but we'll talk about that soon enough. This is one of those movies that is just extremely easy to pick to death, which I'm about to do in a second. But I want to be clear, it's okay. You can take your kids to it. You'll have fun. But every joke people made about this thing from the trailers was 100% right. But before I get into it, let me talk about my sponsor, Honkai Star Rail. Honkai Star Rail is an epic space fantasy RPG. Created by Hoyoverse, the same creators of Genshin Impact, this game is great. It's free to play, it's across platforms, it works on PC, mobile, and PS5s. And once there, you can explore new worlds, meet new friends, master incredible powers and strategy in Honkai's epic turn-based combat. Assemble your team with dozens of customizable characters, with each one having a rich backstory and stellar voice acting for a great interstellar adventure. And with the release of Update 1.5, there are whole new worlds and stories to discover. Like Bellabog, you also have the Fixtral Gardens. There's never been more to do, and there's never been a better time to try. And not just activities, you also have great new characters to try out like Ho-Ho, a little girl with a cursed tail that has a little bit of a mind of its own. Both Ho-Ho's support and her attack and energy buffs, she just might be able to help her team to victory. Or if you want to play a little bit more aggressively and rock the pretty boy look, you can try out Argenti. A quiet knight with devastating AoE attacks, but keeps it classy with a rose flourish. Together, these two will help you conquer any enemy, and you can ran out that cast with the return of four-star character Hanya. And from there on, you'll be on your way to uncovering all the mysteries of Honkai Star Rail. I've never been one for turn-based strategy games, but Honkai Star Rail has been an absolute blast. So if you're interested in trying out for the first time, Go ahead, it's free. But use the link down in the description to experience all these new characters, and be sure to try out the redemption code to make sure you earn an extra 50 stellar jade. This game? It's good, worth the hype. I know the ads are everywhere, but honestly, I understand why now. But back to the video. Now, just basic premise. Wish is the story about the Kingdom of Rosas, a Mediterranean-esque kingdom where a wizard takes people's wishes when they turn 18, and even occasionally grants a select few of them, with those he takes from just forgetting their wish forever, because that's better for them. This just keeps going, till one day a girl realizes that the only thing that the king is collecting besides wishes is bullshit. From there on, our local Disney heroine Asha wishes on a star, and it comes crashing to Earth to be merchandise bait. Shenanigans ensue. Usually this is the part where I give all my praises before diving into what I didn't like, this is a case where you can just add a grain of sugar to everything I say rather than salt. So let's just start with our quirky girl lead, Asha. She's fine. She's a standard Disney heroine, a little goofy, a little fun, and cares oh so much about others, just the perfect role model. Now I'm not on like the quirky lead hate train. Disney clearly has a tight when it comes to its animated leads. Of all the things that handicap Asha as a memorable lead, despite being performed beautifully by Ariana Dubo, the thing that hampers Asha is that she doesn't have a strong emotional connection to elevate her and this movie. Asha, low-key, doesn't have an arc in this film. If you say there's a shift in her world, View, it happens by the end of Act 1, and by that point she has fallen to decide what she's gonna do, breaks who she was at the beginning of the film, with the rest of the story just being about the mechanics of getting the thing. Rather than her having some compelling story about want versus need, she's instead just doing a thing. Which I think can be fine. Not every protagonist needs to have a giant arc to make the story satisfying. Sometimes it can just be the side characters who truly learn and grow from this experience. But they all suck, so that's not what happened. But Instead, what I think damages Asha and by extension this movie is that the film is so high on the idea of the beauty and importance of wishes and by proxy Disney's legacy. So the movie doesn't give Asha a significant enough connection to really hook us and bring this film home. Frozen would have failed if it wasn't focused on the sisterly bond between Anna and Elsa. Encanto is a bit of a mess, but it is built around and saved by Mirabelle's connection to her family. This is the thing that elevates every Disney story. It's what helps to define the main character and their relationship to the world. Having an active emotional connection that the story uses to pluck out our heartstrings and motivate the characters. Asha, though, by contrast, just has her ailing grandfather and mother. They are her whole goal, but they spend most of the film on the sidelines. When it becomes about them as a family, 
The movie kind of gets good. When they're not here, which is most of the time, Asha slips into being just a standard heroine. Even if the family is the motivation, it slips into generic hero do good because good to do, which while serviceable, isn't compelling. It makes the narrative feel like a story where anyone could have been the lead, leaving Asha feel like she doesn't have a leg to stand on or even stand out. The biggest saving grace is that her actress is seeing her heart out, so I think that plus the character's just general good enoughness is able to keep their head above water. And that's just by a little bit unlike everyone else in this story. I don't hate the goat sidekick, which is shocking since I am a habitual hater of talking animal sidekicks. While the goat is kind of useless, he's not that intrusive, but he's also not that funny, even though I do love the voice actor. But the dissonance of that D voice is way more distracting than it is cute. But at least I feel something about him, which is more than I can say for the seven knockoffs over here. Asha has a whole friend group that is just here to fill space and to be a reference to the seven dwarves. They honestly feel like the friends from How to Train Your Dragon, where if this was a show, the story would have enough time to flesh them out. But here, they just exist. They are relevant-ish to the story, but they are fully superfluous. And I genuinely think that the story would be better off condensing them all into like two characters, who could actually be friends and have a unique connection to Asha, as they do do one interesting thing with one of them. But then it's barely addressed, it's rendered basically irrelevant afterwards, and the conclusion is weak. If it were a smaller group, they might have been able to do a lot more with it and make it a lot more meaningful. As is, I didn't care. Instead, they just end up being a reference in a movie filled with references. And some of them are cute. Some of them are fitting. Others are a little cringe and just too on the nose. Like if you see the one with the paper airplane, it was a lot. You'll know when you see it. The characters in this film are just not that spectacular. This movie honestly feels like it started with the concept of being about wishes, then had to invent a story and everything else to help fit that theme. But more importantly, the myth and iconography of the Disney brand. But if I can be nice for a second, I do think that the music for this film, it's fun, it's fine. I've seen other people pick the music for this film apart, that it's a Lin Mel Miranda light, that it, yeah, it does have that one line where the villain says the same thing twice. I let you live it for free. And I don't even charge you it. But I personally do think it's, eh, it's good. I'm not really musically inclined, so I can't really point out why something hits and why others don't. But this film, it's all bops. There's one or two songs that come close to bangers. They hit all the emotional beats that they need to for the story, and everyone singing is giving their all. Though I will also note that the Disney villain song is probably one of the weakest villain songs they've ever done. Like, it's shocking to me that Hawk Moth from Miraculous was able to do a better Disney villain song than an actual Disney villain. Though weirdly enough, Enough, the best villain song of 2023 was Raphael's final act from Baldur's Gate 3. That shit was iconic. But the music here, I enjoy, not gonna say more than that. Rip to all the kids are gonna be blasting it for their parents, though none of it is coming close to Let It Go or Bruno. Moving on, let's go back to the villain. Magnifico is a watered down Disney villain. He's Okay, I'm relieved that we have an actual villain for a change and not a twist one or generational trauma. But Magnifico as a whole is kind of just missed potential. The parts are all there, but none of them ever click enough to make him into something great. I think the issue for him is that the writers just really hit a snag when creating him. As in one hand, he's supposed to be a throwback to the more dastardly and over-the-top villains of early Disney. But on the other, the story really wants to make a point that he's really just a guy. That he's not some omnipotent or special individual who deserves this position that he gets to decide who grants the wishes, but really he's just a narcissist who people made the mistake of trusting in. So these two ideas of what this villain could be are completely at odds with each other, as old school Disney is built around scenery chewing evil guys, feeling more like mythological beings who exist solely to be here and to be defeated by the hero. They do not need to be deep, they don't need to even feel like real people, they just need to be fun, and we will enjoy every second of them. But in so fully embracing their role as the antagonist, they reach truly iconic status. Magnifico, meanwhile, feels like he's being undercut by pretty much every decision the story makes, as it wants us to know that he's really just a petty bitch, but also wants to hint at a tragic backstory that justifies why he created Rosas, and he maybe at some point was a decent guy that he has reasons for doing what he's doing, but then it wants him to be hammy and over the top, seeing about he wants everyone to love and respect him, that he is just a dick basically. His backstory is never expanded upon, so he can never truly become a compelling modern tragic villain. Magnifico is getting the worst of both worlds. He's not over the top enough to be truly amazing, and he's not deep enough to be sympathetic. He's entertaining enough, but he's begging for that extra kind of panache to really elevate him. And the move that they make to make him go full evil being just, it's dumb and contrived. Just as dumb as it was in Multiverse of Madness. Though I do think his fate at the end was very fitting. 
All right, that's enough being nice. Let's talk about the art style. So when the trailers for this movie came out, a lot of people were weirded out by the aesthetic of this film, as rather than making a 2D film to celebrate Disney's 100th anniversary, what they did is just kind of create a pastiche, a 3D film that was meant to look like a storybook with watercolor slightly washed out backgrounds, like the Disney books we all grew up with as kids. Which on paper isn't the worst idea in the world, but the issue comes in the execution. But rather than fully committing to this storybook look, Wish feels like it's being held prisoner by the Disney brand, and it has to, for marketing purposes, look like the other 3D movies that came before. Movies that, mind you, were already too close to each other in appearance. So much so that you could drop the leads of Tangled into Frozen and no one would question it from a distance. This means that this new aesthetic that they're trying to do gave some people the impression that it looks like an Instagram filter rather than a major creative choice. Which I get, but here's my thing. This film doesn't commit enough to the style it shows. When you're watching the film, you mostly get used to it after a while. But that jank never fully goes away. As years of Disney film and modern animation trending more towards detail and realism, this all leads me to look at this film and my first reaction and continued reaction while watching it is that it looks unfinished. That there's a layer of detail missing, that it didn't get fully rendered. Detail has been something that Disney has gone all in on over the years. From being able to see the light bounce off a character's skin to little hairs on the face we see in Encanto. Disney has spent an obscene amount of money in putting as many little details as they can. So to then go see this after the fact does make it feel like something is missing, without having enough impact to really make this creative choice worth it. This movie looks the best at night, where the flat lighting makes sense given the scene. But in daylight, there are some rough shots in this film, where all sense that you can ignore just falls away as the lighting just doesn't feel like actual lighting. It looks like the characters were brightened a bit just for certain scenes, only for the scenes themselves not to really support it. It feels artificial, that something is missing, which in this case would be that extra glow and soft lighting and shadows that would really just usually accompany these things. But that would clash then with the painted storybook look, which, okay, this is the best way I can describe the aesthetic of Wish. This film at times, looks like a stage play. One where the only thing that really exists in the shot is the character and a painted background. Like, this is the thing that had me cackling once I realized it, as I went, fuck, I'm never gonna unsee it. As the backgrounds for this movie, they're beautiful on their own. But they have a problem in that they're trying to look so painted that it actually does too good of a job. So much so that it ends up fucking with your depth perception. So rather than looking like a world that has a storybook look, it looked like people are standing in front of a piece of canvas that was painted on, with me being unable to tell what's an actual object in the scene and what is just painted in there. You notice this the most in the kitchen scene, as the most things in the background, like, they don't look like they're there. So it leads to this distance where you have weirdly lit characters that feel like they're standing in front of a painting. And this definitely could have worked if it was 2D, but then being 3D caused the illusion to break. So they end up not complimenting each other, instead making this contrast just feel weird and off-putting. And if you want like the best example of this, just watch the hands. The faces are often like, they make sure to do just enough so you don't fully notice it. That detail is not exactly there with the hands, as shadows are often supposed to be there. But with the hands, it often feels like there's information missing, as there are lots of shots where the source of light tells us that something should be brighter, or maybe even the shadow of one finger should be on the other. But often enough, it isn't, and that ends up breaking the look that this film is going for, and it contributes to the sense of artificialness that it's incomplete in moments, as the style doesn't come in up to being different, and in trying to do limited detail on painted backgrounds, ignoring the lighting of the film causes so many scenes to feel like we're not getting enough information to really understand what should be going on here, and when we do, it feels like like something is missing. Like we don't really know like how bright something is, how it's lighting the characters, and like this is the one one that I caught in the trailer. Rather than Asha's hand leaving the shadow of her friend into the light, we don't really see enough shadows for that to appear. So instead, it just looks like it's changing colors. Like someone flipped a switch and said, be brighter now. Yes, this doesn't look as rough in the theater, but I also saw this in Dolby Cinema, and it's still a persistent problem throughout the film. I don't want to discount any of the people who worked on this thing, especially after all the layoffs Disney did this year, they have enough grief to deal with. But this aesthetic reminds me of the Dragon Prince season 1, where they mess with the frame rate to distracting results. Even if it works or isn't noticeable all the time, this feels like an idea that should have been strangled in the crib earlier. I'm sure the art book for this film will be amazing, but the final product leaves a lot to be desired. And in a film meant to celebrate Disney's 100th anniversary, all it succeeds in doing is highlight how the former king of the industry is now failing to innovate. Truly, I do not hate this film, 
but it's just one of those movies that is just I am very lukewarm on and the weird things in it stick out way more than the things that it does well. But I did enjoy watching it. Mostly. It's a fun enough time at the theaters, kids will enjoy it, but it's just all right to me. The most 6 out of 10 experience I have ever had. There's not really much for me to say in spoilers, though I will include one idea that hit me down below in the comments. Go check out if you're interested, wait for streaming if you're not. This movie, it exists, but you can at least give the soundtrack a listen on YouTube. Alright, that's all from me. Let me know what you all thought of the movie, send your thanks to the people who made it, and it seems like the people who actually make these things are getting the shorter and shorter end of the stick these days. Like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out my sponsor, Hunkai Star Rail. Love you all, peace out.